Thank you for coming out tonight. As Matt said, my name is Ritaparna Basu. I'm a healthcare policy analyst here at ARI. Um, and basically, my job here is to research and study government intervention in healthcare. And there's a lot to study. There's a lot of government intervention and distortion in healthcare. So this is a big year for my area. We have a couple of big anniversaries this year. Um, Obamacare turns five years old, if you can believe it. Um, and there's going to be a lot, there's a lot of conversation about that. The Supreme Court is going to hear oral arguments again regarding Obamacare in just three weeks, I believe. So we could have some interesting stuff coming out of that um, this summer. The other big anniversary, uh, which I want to talk about tonight, is Medicare. Medicare turns 50 years old this summer. It was passed in 1965. Now there's a lot of there's a lot you can say about Medicare, and throughout the year I've got several projects to you know talk about Medicare from different aspects. How has it all added up 50 years later? What's the impact been on the quality of healthcare? Um, what's the impact been on doctors? Today I want to talk about Medicare's fiscal situation because that's something really big to talk about as well. So Medicare. Basically, the minute they passed it, what was really unique about Medicare was how expensive the program was. Immediately, right off the bat, it was a very, very expensive program. And throughout the years, it's been way more expensive than they've ever, ever imagined. Let me just give you an idea, 50 years later, how Medicare spending is escalating. A few graphs, I'll take you through them, they're not that complicated, I promise. But just to give you an idea of how quickly Medicare spending is growing. In 2002, oops, point. In 2002, Medicare spent $285 billion. Ten years, in 10 years, it went up to almost $500 billion. $500 billion of the federal government is spending on health care for seniors, health care for permanently disabled Americans, and some other groups. Last year, from 500 billion in 2012, Medicare spent 603 billion. And in less than 10 years, it's gonna go up to one, almost 1.1 $1 .1 trillion dollars. So Medicare is getting expensive, it's costing a lot, it's going up really fast, the cost. And it's a pretty much a unique problem to Medicare in the sense that if you look at other spending in the federal budget, if you look at what the government is projected to spend on Medicaid, on Obamacare, on Social Security, on everything else, Medicare spending is going faster than all of that. It's contributing to our deficit. It's the main contributor to our deficit. It's contributing to our rising debt levels. So 50 years later, Medicare spending, most people would agree, is out of control. And to put this in perspective, what does it mean if Medicare is spending $1.1 $1 .1 trillion? What does that even mean? At the end of the day, what it means is that all of us in this room are going to have to be paying a lot more in taxes for the Medicare program. If you look at this graph here, it shows how much the, the average American household is spending on Medicare. In 1970, it was $129, the average American household. In 2010, $4,000, more than $4,000, every American household, every American family was paying in taxes for Medicare before paying for anything else that the, uh, that the government does. If nothing changes, if Medicare spending continues, in 2021, so less than 10 years from now, the average family is going to be spending almost $8,000 just on Medicare. So Medicare spending goes up, it means we have less of our own money that we've earned to spend on our own priorities, to spend on our own goals. So this is a real problem. Now the question is, what do we do about it? What do we do about Medicare, Medicare spending problem? Now my view, and perhaps many of you in this room share this view, is we need to phase out Medicare. We need to hold it the end goal Let's get rid of Medicare. Let's repeal it. 
People talk about repealing Obamacare, nobody talks about repealing Medicare. That should be our end goal. And it's not just, I think, because it's very expensive. It's imposing a lot of burdens on people. And Medicare is the start of socialized medicine in this country. People would have much better health care, much better quality health care, seniors would have much better quality health care, I believe, in a free market. And Medicare really has caused all of the problems we have in health care. We got Obamacare because the health care market was apparently all messed up, and it was. And Medicare was a big part of that. So I think we need to be repealing Medicare, phasing it out. Now that's a big case to make, and I won't have the time to make full case for that tonight. What I want to do, though, is go into one argument. One argument that I think is propping up Medicare. One argument that it's, it's, impo it's important to be able to answer if we want to start moving Medicare in the right direction, scaling it back, phasing it out. And this argument that I want to talk about, it really goes to the heart of what people think Medicare even is. So what is Medicare? People don't even realize what Medicare is. So let's be clear on what Medicare is. Medicare is a welfare program. It is a giant welfare program. If you're on Medicare, it means the federal government is paying your medical bills, most of your medical bills. And since the federal government doesn't produce anything, it means that taxpayers are paying most of your medical bills. If you're on Medicare, it means you're living off of your kids and your grandkids and other people's kids and other people's grandkids. That's what Medicare is. But this is not how Medicare is usually described. It's not how it's presented. It's not how we've been taught to think about the program. Instead, here's how Medicare is often presented. This is Barack Obama, but it really could be anybody. He says, Medicare and Social Security are not handouts. You've paid into these programs your whole lives. You've earned them. You've earned them. So Medicare benefits, on this very popular notion, they're not coming at the expense of other people. They're not welfare. They're not handouts. Seniors have paid for them. They've supposedly paid for these benefits. They've earned them. They've been paying into it their whole lives. Now this is a real problem if this is an argument that goes unanswered. And it often goes unanswered. It makes it very challenging to do anything about Medicare spending problem. So I said I wanted to phase out Medicare. Forget phasing it out. Just forget that. If you want to make the tiniest change to Medicare, if you want to scale back benefits just a tiny bit, you still want to keep the whole program, but you just want to cut it a little bit, get that spending under control just a little bit. Even that, that's hard to do because people say, well, I earned it. You can't, you can't change my Medicare benefits. So you might remember in the last presidential election, this happened a lot. So Obamacare cut $716 billion from Medicare. And this was a big deal. This was a huge deal. Because how can, how can you cut Medicare? How can you take money out of Medicare when seniors have been paying into that program? It's their money. And you see this argument, this notion that Medicare's earned. You see it in, in places you wouldn't even expect. Even Tea Partiers, for example, right? Tea Partiers are committed to limited government. They want government to be doing less things. They want it to be smaller. And Medicare's this giant government program is getting bigger. So it seems clear they should be against Medicare. They should want to s drastically reduce its size, if not get rid of it entirely. But even they, when they hear that some politician wants to scale back Medicare, even they will take to the streets. And they will say, keep government out of my Medicare. Don't touch my Medicare. Hands off my Medicare. It's mine. I've paid for it. You have no right to touch it. 
So this argument has to be answered because otherwise there's so much resistance towards making any sort of changes to Medicare, forget about phasing it out. So I want to say three things tonight about this notion that Medicare benefits are earned. First, they're not earned. You should think of Medicare as welfare because that's what it is. Second, if Medicare isn't earned, why do people think it's earned? What's going on? Because certainly people don't hold other welfare programs as earned. Nobody thinks about Medicaid, which is the government program for lower income Americans. Nobody says, oh, Medicaid is earned. It's only Medicare. Why is that? And lastly, there's a whole debate. There's a whole debate. It's already happening, and it's going to ramp up about what to do about Medicare spending. It's a conversation that has to be had because the trajectory is just not something that you could ignore. What role is this notion that Medicare benefits are earned? What role is that going to have in this debate, given it's a wrong notion? So those are the three things. Sound OK? OK. All right, so to start. First thing, Medicare benefits, you shouldn't think of them as earned. You can start to see this, I think, if you start asking certain questions. Like, if you've been paying into Medicare your whole life, right? If you've been paying into something genuinely, right? Something legitimate, where's the money? Where's the money that you have been alleged, you know, supposedly been, where is it? You've been paying into it. Where is it kept? Because there's something very funny you hear in Medicare and in Social Security too, right? You hear about this trust fund. Medicare is a trust fund. Social Security is a trust fund. And every few years, the headline will be, oh no, you know, the trust fund is running out. There's not enough money in the trust fund. We have to do something. And then somebody comes along and takes credit for saying, or for allegedly extending the life of the trust fund. That's what Obamacare did. That was one of the selling points that Obama used, that, hey, look, I extended the life of the trust fund by eight years. Wh why is this trust fund always in jeopardy if you've been paying into something? Why isn't the money just there? How can it be running out? And why is it imposing all these burdens, increasing burdens, on everybody else, on American families? How can those two things go together? Now, one possibility. And it's kind of understandable if you have you know, this, this idea. It's wrong. But it's, well, you could think, well, the government screwed it up. right? We get the, the government's supposed to be handling our money. We're paying our Medicare taxes. The government's supposed to be handling it. And they squandered it. They messed it up, because they do that a lot. right? So maybe that's why the money's not there. Maybe they put it in some fund. It was a terrible idea. And they lost the money. Or they didn't really think. Well, look, we're going to have all this new healthcare technology, all these new treatments. It's going to be expensive, and they didn't manage the money right, and they messed it up. But that's not what happened. You could think that, but that's actually not what's going on. And nobody says that's what's going on. Nobody thinks that that's what's going on in terms of people running Medicare, in terms of them explaining what's going on. It's not the case that something in Medicare has gone wrong, that the money isn't there. Medicare is working exactly like it's supposed to be working, exactly like it's designed to be working. So let's take a little a deeper look into how Medicare works. So people think that seniors, or it, it, all Americans, are paying in to a program, that they, whatever taxes are being taken from them, that they're being saved, that they're being invested for them. The reality is that the senior today, the senior today, 88% of what they get from Medicare, of their benefits, I pay for. Not me alone, but you know, people in my generation, everybody else, not seniors. 88%. The other 12% is what seniors pay through premiums and such when they're on Medicare. 
What happened to everything that seniors, I mean, seniors today during their working lives, what happened to the money that they had been quote putting in? Well, it went to pay for yesterday's seniors. And when I retire, everything I've been putting in, it'll all be gone. Somebody else, somebody younger than me, will be paying for my medical bills. So at no point is anybody paying for their own health care in Medicare. It's always at the expense of somebody else. Another way to look at this is that today's senior is getting three times more in benefits than they ever paid in taxes. So if you retired in 2011, average income, you would have paid around $60,000 in Medicare taxes throughout your working life. You are going to get $180,000 in Medicare benefits if you add up all the health care you're going to get. Everybody, every senior, $180,000, three times. I mean, give or take, but three times, a lot more than they ever put in. The only way that's possible, right, the only way that's possible is that whatever you put in has no connection with what you're getting out. It has nothing to do. What you put in is gone. What you get out is what the government decides to give you, how lavish the government decides to be with other people's money, with my money, since right now I'm paying in. And when I retire, I know I will not be getting three times as much as I've been taxed. There's no way if you look at the how the spending is going. But I want to be clear here. You can look at this and you can think, well, this isn't, OK, yeah, it's true. Technically, the senior today, the Medicare benefits that they're getting, they did not, that's not their money. It's my money, right? And yeah, there's a problem in the fact that today seniors are getting three times more than what they put in. That's a problem. But what if you were breaking even? What if you were breaking even? In Social Security, it's closer. You're not breaking even. You're actually losing some now. But it's closer. You don't get three times more in benefits like you're getting in Medicare. Is that still welfare? So I want to be clear. This is not just an issue of, well, this is literally not your money that you're getting. It's not just an issue of, well, if I'm paying $60,000 in taxes and I get $60,000 back when I retire, everything's fine. There's a big difference between me spending $60,000 and the government spending $60,000 quote on me. So let's compare. What's the difference if you're spending your own money versus the government administering a program like Medicare? If you're paying, if you say, OK, I'm going to spend $60,000. I have $60,000. I'm going to decide how to spend it. The first thing you'd have to decide is how much you wanted to put aside for your health care. Right? You'd have to decide how much do you want to put aside. It's not an obvious question. It kind of really depends on what you want in life. What are your priorities? What are your goals? What's important to you? Do you want to save enough money so that at the end of your life you can extend it by two months, by three months? Is that super important to you? It might be. Or would you rather save less for then? and instead put more into the right now, into building your business, into having another child, into traveling the world like you want to do. This is something you have to decide. And you'd be able to decide this if you were spending your own money. And in Medicare, what happens? The government decides. The government decides, well, this is how much you're going to put aside for your health care in retirement. And, in, and, it's tr and today it's true. The government spends a lot of money on end-of-life care, on extending your life by, the, by very small amounts, but they spend a lot of money. 
But what good is that, I say, what good is that if you weren't able to live the kind of life you wanted in the first place, to extend that life? If you were spending the money, you'd be able to decide what was more important to you. If you were spending your own money, you would have to decide how much you want to save for your retirement, and you would, uh, you would be able to decide how you want to save for your retirement. Again, not an obvious issue, right? You want to save it, you want to invest it. If you want to invest it, how do you want to invest it? What funds do you think you'll get the best return in? If you want to buy an insurance policy, what kind of insurance policy do you want to buy? Which insurance companies do you think would be, are the best bet? Under Medicare, the government decides. The government decides how much it wants to spend. You really have no say in it. Every time they talk about Medicare, changing, making changes in Medicare, one of the things you always hear is death panels, right? People get scared of death panels. There's a sense in which it's overblown. But there's another sense in which it's a very, very legitimate concern, right? Because the government is deciding. You have no control. The government is deciding how much it wants to spend on your health care. Right now, it's saying I get three times back. Tomorrow, it's not going to say that. There's no way. It's going to have to make some tough choices. And that's something to be scared of. The cuts have to come somewhere. If you were spending your own money, $60,000, deciding how to save it for your uh, health care retirement, you would get to decide what kind of health care you wanted to buy. What do you want to buy with your money? You have that choice. You have that control. Under Medicare, the government decides the kind of health care that you are going to get. So if you follow the Medicare news, as I do, what you always see is any new technology that comes out, any new treatment, there is a massive fight, a massive battle. Should Medicare cover this or should it not cover this? Right, because new stuff is expensive. New technology is expensive, right, by its nature. And the government has to decide, is it worth it? Is it worth it to give this to seniors or is it not worth it? You're not making that decision. The government's making that decision. So for example, and this is just one example. Have you guys heard of this new kind of radiation treatment called proton beam therapy? Oh, good. In my other talks, nobody had heard of it. That's good. <laughs> I know you have some doctors in the room, so that makes sense. Um, so proton beam therapy, it's this new technology. It's super cool, I think. It's this new way of radiating cancers. So you have cancer, you get radiation therapy, right? So this is a new type of radiation. Instead of using x-rays, they're using protons. It can be more accurate. Instead of killing good cells and bad cells, they can be more specific. They can try to kill only the bad cells. It's got the potential to be more precise, work better for people. It's also very expensive. It's a great thing, but it's expensive. And there's a whole debate. Should Medicare cover it or should it not? And a lot of times Medicare doesn't cover it. Sometimes it does. And they're going to have to make a decision at the national level. Do we think this is worth it? Because a lot of people say, no, it's not worth it. Seniors should just be going getting traditional radiation. If you were spending your own money, you could decide. Is it worth it to get this new technology? Maybe it's not tested as well as older technologies. But do you want it? Do you think it's worth the risk? Are you willing to pay for the benefit? You would get to decide. In Medicare, you're completely dependent on the government when you're on Medicare. You haven't paid for it. You have no hand in what the government's going to do, how much it's going to spend on you. The health care you get is not a reflection of your choices, of your priorities. You're entirely dependent on the government. This, I think, puts it squarely in the category of a welfare program. Oops. Welfare program. To say you've earned Medicare is to suggest that you had something to do with the Medicare benefits you're getting. But in reality, you didn't. So the question then is, why do people think Medicare is not a welfare program? Why do people think 
put it in this category of I earned Medicare, I had something to do with Medicare, I paid for it, I produced it in some way. Why is there even a sense of pride? Because to say you earned something is a good thing, right? You should be earning things in life. So, a few months ago, if you were following the news, you would have heard of this guy named Jonathan Gruber. Heard of him? Right? He's this professor at MIT. He's the architect of Obamacare, architect of Romney Care. And he got into a lot of trouble because these videos started surfacing of him telling his colleagues, telling all of his other, you know, academic friends or whatever, just boasting, basically boasting about how they had to lie to the American people to get Obamacare passed. That they had to just say what Americans wanted to hear to get the program passed. And the example Gruber uses, one of the examples he uses is, if people knew that Obamacare that one of the fundamental things going on was healthy people subsidizing sick people. He said Americans wouldn't go for it. They don't like those types of handout programs. Now, he got into a lot of trouble. Everyone was really shocked. I wasn't. Because this is exactly, literally exactly what they did to pass Medicare. They had a similar problem with Medicare. It was actually a bigger problem, and they told a much bigger lie. And it's a much bigger lie because we're talking about it today, because people still believe it today. But it was a very similar situation when Medicare, they are trying to pass Medicare. Medicare was passed in 1965, but it had been on the ballot, on the, you know, the progressive left had tried to get it passed since the early 1900s, some sort of Medicare they wanted. And it wasn't getting passed for various reasons. And they were learning as they went why it wasn't getting passed. And they were trying to figure it out. And one of the things they figured out pretty quickly, really, is Medicare is very hostile. This whole concept of Medicare, the whole concept of this entitlement program for the elderly. It's hostile. It's, a, it's completely the opposite of the American spirit. Right? Because the American spirit, still today, definitely more back then, was a spirit of individualism. It was a spirit of self-reliance. It was a spirit of being able to take care of yourself, not reaching into other people's pockets, counting on that to take care of yourself. That was the American spirit. And they knew Medicare was a giant entitlement program, what to do. So they, they did what Jonathan Gruber did. So the guy, I think, whose name, you know, if you associate Jonathan Gruber with Obamacare, with Medicare, it's a guy named Robert Ball. He was really the architect of Social Security as well. And he writes pretty openly. It's not even after the fact, 1962, so before Medicare is passed. He's writing in the New England Journal of Medicine. He says, we have to give American, feeling, American workers the feeling that they have earned their benefits. The feeling. Because if we don't give them the feeling, then they won't go for Medicare. If they see Medicare as an entitlement program for the elderly, they won't go for it. Because Americans didn't want to be on welfare. They thought it was shameful to be on welfare, to be on the dole. So he said, we have to give American workers the feeling that that's not what's going on. And so there was a deliberate project. There was a deliberate project, a whole campaign to dress up Medicare as something that it wasn't. To dress it up not as a handout, but as a program where people could feel, yes, I'm being self-reliant when I'm on Medicare. I am taking care of myself. I'm not living off of others. I'm taking care of myself. So they told two big lies. Jonathan Gruber and Obamacare's proponents told several lies. They told several lies in Medicare too. Let's talk about two big lies they told. The first is that they said Medicare is like insurance. People love insurance. Insurance is great. People feel like, and legitimately so, they've earned their insurance benefits. If you've been paying into an insurance pool, if you have a contract with an insurance company and you have a claim that's covered, you're totally in the right to file a claim. 
to get those benefits. You've earned it. So they dressed up Medicare as insurance. But it's just a dressing up, very superficial. So they call it insurance, right? Medicare is health insurance. What do you get from Medicare? You get benefits, insurance benefits, right? You don't get subsidies, you don't get anything like that. You get benefits. You don't get 100% subsidy. It's not that as soon as you turn 65 or you retire, the government's paying for all of your health care. No, there's premiums in Medicare. There's something a little bit you have to pay yourself. 88% everyone else pays, 12% you pay as a senior. Premiums, that's what they call them. Sounds like insurance. And probably the biggest thing, the biggest way they tried to conflate the two is they thought, what gives people the feeling in insurance that they've earned their benefits? It's the idea that they've been paying into a certain pool. They've been paying into a certain pool knowing that if something happens, they can collect. So let's make Medicare like that. Let's not have it so that as soon as you turn 65, you qualify for Medicare. Oh, no, no. Let's make it so you have to pay in, too. And by pay in, we mean you have to be taxed for Medicare when you're working, and so that you now earn the right to tax others when you turn 65. First of all, it's not true. It's not true that you have to pay into Medicare to qualify for Medicare. A lot of people, so most people, you have to pay 10 years of payroll tax to qualify for Medicare, you have to pay in. But it's not even true. My grandmother immigrated here two years ago from India. She gets to be on Medicare in five years. She hasn't paid into Medicare, so it's not true. It's just that's the ma what majority of people need to do to be able to qualify for Medicare to make it look like there's something legitimate going on like insurance, but it's not really true. Plenty of people can get on it. But even if it were true, that only people who can get Medicare are people who have been taxed for Medicare in the past, this wouldn't make it earned, right? Because there's major differences between what happens in insurance and what happens in Medicare. Right? When you're, buy when you're paying into a pool in insurance, you're not paying for other people's health care. That's not the goal of insurance, to pay for other people's health care. When you buy a health insurance policy or any other policy, you're not buying it to foot anybody else's bills, right? You're buying it for you to protect yourself from certain risks because you think it's a good idea. And yes, it's true that your premiums, if you don't file a claim, go to other people. That's true. That's the business model, but that's not the fundamental. That's not what's going on. And in insurance, you do this voluntarily, right? You do it voluntarily when you think it makes sense. You do it knowing certain things that you may get out more than you put in or you may get out less. And everybody knows this and they're okay with this and they've agreed to it and there's contracts. None of this is happening in Medicare. You can't earn a right to have other people pay for your health care. You can't have a right to force other people to pay for your medical bills. And that's essentially what Medicare does. And it doesn't make any difference that you are forced to pay for other people's health care. It doesn't make a difference. And it doesn't make it insurance. I mean, the easiest way I think about it is, if Medicare is insurance, why do we need Medicare? Because insurance existed before Medicare. Health insurance existed before Medicare. Six out of 10 seniors had health insurance before Medicare, and that number was growing. That percentage was growing every decade. And the reason it wasn't higher is because government was already meddling in health care, and you can ask about that. But Medicare is not insurance, even though they dressed it up as much as they could as insurance to make people think, yeah, I earned Medicare like I earned my insurance benefits. And the other lie, the big lie, is they said Medicare is a trust fund. It's like a trust fund. Because people like trust funds, right? 
trust fund, you put your money in, it's safe. At a later time, you get to draw from that. So they said, let's dress it up like a trust fund. Even though there's no saving going on, there's no investment going on, literally the second that you pay your Medicare taxes, it goes to a, another person. Like literally, the very second. All the trust fund is, is one account, one made up account for one type of expense. So seniors, their hospital expenses are paid through the trust fund. And the trust fund gets its money from everybody's payroll taxes. That's all the trust fund is. So you pay your payroll taxes, you see it as a line item on your, on your paycheck every month. It goes to the Medicare trust fund where it stays for 2.5 seconds and then it goes to another senior. That's the trust fund. And when they say, oh my gosh, the trust fund's going insolvent. Oh my gosh, we're running out, we're running low. We have to save it, we have to extend its life. All that means is the payroll tax is not enough. Payroll tax is not enough to pay for seniors' hospital expenses. And so they either have to raise the payroll tax or they have to find the money elsewhere. They have to go into the general revenues and take the money from there. But there's no dress fund. It's a myth. So the whole thing was made up. Medicare was sold as self-reliance, sold as a program by which Americans could feel good, feel virtuous. But in reality, it outlaws self-reliance. It does the exact opposite of what they said. It would, do, it would do. Because, let's be clear, Medicare is not a choice. You don't have a choice about being on Medicare. When you retire, you have to go on Medicare. You're forced to go into Medicare. If you say, I don't want Medicare, you give up rights to all of your Social Security benefits. And that's not something that most people can afford to do, given they've been taxed to death their whole lives. So when you retire, when it comes to your health care, you have to live off of, off of other people. You're forced to be dependent on, on other people. You're forced to be dependent on the government. You're forced to reach into other people's pockets for your own survival, for your own medical bills. When you're young, Medicare treats you like everybody's milk cow. When you're older, as Ayn Rand would put it, I think, is it turns everybody into a looter. To get my health care, I have to loot somebody else. To get my health care, I need victims to loot. So then the last thing. How is this whole notion of Medicare being earned? How is it going to play in to the Medicare debate going forward? The situation now is they're running out of victims. They're running out of people whose pockets to fleece to pay for the health care of seniors. Because that's what Medicare requires. It requires pockets to fleece. It requires victims. And they're running out. All the ways, the legal ways that they have to pay for Medicare are not enough. Are not enough to pay for all the baby boomers retiring for all the health care that they could possibly need. You might have heard this phrase, unfunded liabilities. You heard this, unfunded liabilities. What's an unfunded liability? An unfunded liability is basically, it's basically the situation that the government has made such lavish promises, such, such, such lavish promises to a certain group of people that to meet those commitments, even halfway, even halfway, would mean imposing a lot of pain on other people. That's what an unfunded liability is. What is Medicare's unfunded liability? Depends on who you ask. 43 trillion is the lower bound. 100 trillion is the upper bound. I'm not an economist, so I can't really weigh in on what's more accurate. But take the lower bound. There's not enough pain in the world to, to come up with 43 trillion. You could tax every millionaire, every billionaire, everything that they have, you wouldn't get 43 trillion dollars six times the size of today's entire economy. And so they can't get all of it. They can't get all the money that they need to be able to pay for these commitments. $43 trillion basically means they would need $43 trillion in the bank right now collecting interest to be able to meet their commitments. They don't have it. They'll try to get it. 
and they've already floated ideas out there. A wealth tax like they have in Europe. Dip into savings accounts, you're told you're not going to be taxed when you take out that money. What's a 5% tax? And they'll always start with the rich because that's the easiest thing to do. And then it'll go down to everybody. But that's where Medicare is going. And the whole question is, why can't we stop this? Why can't we stop the madness? Why can't we stop all this pain <laughs> from having to be inflicted? And part of the reason you can't stop it is because Medicare is. It is this untouchable program. Anytime you say, OK, let's cut Medicare a little bit, then it's, you can't do that. How dare you do that? Right? Seniors are organized. They're a huge block, and they're super organized. Nobody else is that organized, I think, than seniors. And they say, hands off ours. Hands off ours. Don't you dare touch what's ours. And part of what's fueling that mentality is this idea that they've been taught their whole lives that this is something they are absolutely entitled to because they've paid into it, that they've earned it. So going forward, I think, I think it'll be ugly. They'll have to find the money. They'll have to, to find the money to pay, meet these commitments. There'll be a lot of jockeying who to get the money from. It's going to split people into camps, young versus poor, healthy versus sick. Did I say young versus poor? <laughs> Why not? It's been a long day. Young versus old, healthy versus sick. It's going to split people into those camps. Everyone's going to say, well, don't tax me. Tax that other guy. And the other guy's going to say, don't tax me. You know, dip into his savings account a little bit. He's got a million dollars. What's the big deal? And it's all going to be made worse by this idea that, yeah, what we're doing is really giving people what they've earned. Now, the only way to stop this to start to stop this, to start to scale back Medicare and go in the direction of phasing it out. The way to start, I think, is to untangle this original confusion, this original confusion that was purposefully injected into Medicare, It's purposefully injected so that people can't really think about what's going on. It's very purposeful. They want, the proponents of Medicare wanted it to be an untouchable program, and they got that. It's totally untouchable now. And they knew if we attach virtue to this, if we attach any concept of virtue to this program, it will become untouchable, and it has. Now, like I said, Obamacare is also <laughs> sold on false pretenses. This is how all socialized medicine in the United States has been sold. It's been sold under different names. It has to be sold under different names because Americans don't want socialized medicine. But that's how you sell it, by calling it something else and by calling it something good. And it's really up to everybody in this room, everybody in this room, anybody who wants freedom in medicine to stand up and to set the, set the record straight. Thank you. <laughs>